to our Wednesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing a series that I started last week talking about the believer's authority. And I tell you, I've covered some very, very important things. This is one of the most misunderstood teachings in the body of Christ. And so I'd like to encourage you once again to please get the CDs. I've also got DVDs on the believer's authority. I've got a book and I've got a study guide. If you want to get the full teaching on the authority of the believer, then you need to get these materials and uh, they would really, really help you. All right, we've been talking about the authority of the believer and I've been talking about just a, a lot of really powerful things that most people don't think this way. And uh, so I've already covered a lot of material. I hadn't got time to go back and recap it, but let me just say this, that, you know, like a policeman, a policeman really doesn't have that much power. When a, when a policeman stands there and holds up his hand and a big old 18 wheeler comes screeching to a halt, that's not because that policeman has the power to stop that huge truck, but he has the authority. It's all of the power of the government behind him. And when he holds up his hand, his hand can't stop that truck, but the authority behind what he does is what stops that truck. And the policeman is limited to only enforcing what has already been put into law. And you know, I think that that's a good comparison between us as believers. When I'm talking about the believer's authority, this doesn't give you the right to just go out there and do whatever you want to. For instance, here's an example. You know, Jesus stilled the storm and commanded the storm to stop and the waves to be still. And he told us that the works that he did, we can do also. And so I believe that. I've rebuked hurricanes. And of course, I'll never prove this to anybody, but I've, I've rebuked hurricanes or headed for land and we rebuke them and they turn and go in opposite direction. And of course, the unbelievers will say coincidence, but I've seen this happen. I've rebuked rain and command rain to stop. I've commanded storms to stop. I've commanded tornadoes to leave and they have left. And I believe I have that power, but at the same time, it's not up to me to just influence this and release this power and use this authority however I want to for selfish purposes. There is a right and a wrong way to do it. For instance, if I remember, uh, I forget the exact year, but I used to live in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and I remember when I was a kid and just got turned on to the Lord, they had a, I forgot what they called it, but it was something like um, Dallas for Jesus or something. And they had hundreds of thousands of Christians come in from all over the world and they just flooded the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. Many of them were living in tents. Many of them were just sleeping out and they were in, camping in their cars. They had campers. I mean, all of the hotels were taken and nearly every square inch was taken with all of these young people that came together for this rally about Jesus. And during this rally, we had torrential rains. I mean, it rained buckets and people, <laughs> uh, their tents were washed away. And of course, all of these people were praying for good weather for this event. And I remember watching on a news broadcast, a news reporter went up to one of these people that their tent had washed away. It had rained on them. And he said, I thought that y'all have prayed about this and God didn't answer your prayers. And this reporter was asking this in a way that was antagonistic, trying to show that, see, that there isn't a God and God doesn't answer prayers. None of this stuff works. He says, if there, if there was really a God and if he answers prayer, then why didn't he answer your prayers about this weather? And this person I thought was really smart. They said, well, we did pray that we would have good weather, but you know, we've been in a drought and the way I look at it is there was probably a hundred thousand young people praying that we wouldn't have rain. There was probably a million farmers praying that we would have rain, says they just want out. And I thought that was really wisdom. And you know, from that, I've taken a lesson that I do believe I can rebuke storms. I do believe I have that power because Jesus did it and I did it, but I can't do it in just a selfish way. I can't do it for selfish purposes because I want to go have a picnic and we've been in drought and there's a hundred thousand people praying that we'd get rain, but it would mess up my picnic. And so I rebuke the rain and God is going to answer that prayer and 
and, uh, you know, thwart the prayers of all these other people. See, you can't use this authority and power that God has given us in a selfish way. You know, there's many scriptures. Jesus said, take up your cross and deny yourself and follow me. And there's just many, many scriptures that talk about that we need to put God and His will ahead of our own will. And if you take this teaching that I have on the authority of the believer and you start finding out that you can do things, you cannot enforce your authority if it goes contrary to something that God has said. And again, I sometimes do this with uh, people that I don't have authority over you. I've got authority over demons, but I don't have authority over people. And I have p students that come to me all the time and uh, they just expect me to get them well based on my faith. But you know, they have authority and what are they believing? And I've learned that I can't just impose my will or even God's will upon them against their authority. And many times people are doing things that give Satan a direct road, inroad into your life. For instance, James chapter 3, verse 16 says, Where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Envy and strife opens up a door to anything that the devil wants to do in your life. And so I may want you healed. God may want you healed. And I have authority and power, but you also have authority and power. And if you choose to continue in strife, you just throw the door wide open to the devil. In a sense, hope you understand what I'm saying here. He's got a legal right to oppress you because you have cooperated with him. You got offended. You have unforgiveness, bitterness, strife in your heart, and you just opened up a door to the devil. And I don't care how much authority and power I have, it's not going to overrule your personal authority and power over your life. And so people come to me and want me to just produce healing in them, but there is a direct inroad. They have given authority to the devil, and I just can't override that. God himself will not do it. I know some of you are thinking, man, this isn't true. Well, look at this passage of scripture in Mark chapter six. This is when Jesus went into his own hometown of Nazareth. And when he preached, it says in verse three, Mark six, three, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon are not his sisters here with us also. And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. This exact same story is given in Matthew chapter 13. And they were offended in him, but Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. This says that their unbelief stopped Jesus. And when you put that together with Mark chapter 6, where it says he could do no mighty work, the reason he didn't do many mighty works is because he couldn't. He would not force a person to receive. You have authority and you have more authority over yourself than I have over you. Even God himself will not impose his will on you against your will. He will woo you. He will draw you. He will pressure you. He will do things, but ultimately you have the choice. If you want to go to hell, if you want to live in sin, if you want to live in rebellion, if you want to be bitter and sick and whatever, God will not allow me to force God's will upon you. You can choose. And right here you see that Jesus could do no mighty works because of their unbelief. Not that he wouldn't do it. He couldn't do it. And it all goes back to an authority issue. You have to give me or God or anyone the authority to have influence in your life. You know, again, most people don't think this way, but once you get into the Word and you begin to learn these principles, uh, it changes the way you think. But I've told our students many times, I said, I've, I've dealt with tens of thousands of people. I've seen 
uh, characteristics of people who are not seeking the Lord, people who are offended, people who are in unbelief, people who are bitter, whatever. And I've seen these things in people so often. I said, I tell our students, I said, I know that many of you are just like a bomb waiting to explode. You've got attitudes in your life that are wrong. But I said, when you come to school, you follow the rules, you do what you are asked to do, and you know what? I don't go up to those people and tell them and rebuke them and say, you need to straighten this up and change this and change that. I don't tell people that because, you know why? Because they didn't give me the authority. I don't have the authority over other people to just go up and do this. Now, when they're in school, they have submitted to my authority and to the leadership that I've put in place. And if somebody was to do something in school that was influencing other people and causing problems, I'd deal with it. I've actually kicked people out of school before. I just meant, uh, I was just in Dallas-Fort Worth area and the very first uh, couple, a woman and her boyfriend, they were having sex outside of marriage and we dealt with them, gave them a couple of chances and they didn't follow through and we kicked them out of school. She just came to my meetings 14, 15 years later and um, you know what, her life still messed up and she's saying, I need to come back and finish what I started and I welcomed her back. Hope that she comes back. But you know, if it's something like that that influences other people and is a reflection on the ministry and stuff like that, I'll take authority and I'll deal with it. But I see people with attitudes that I don't follow them home. I don't tell them, don't do this, don't do this, because they haven't given me that authority in their life. I know some of you don't think this way. You just go out and spout whatever you want to. But you know, you have to, in a sense, you have to win a person to yourself. And you have to get that person to where they are receptive to you and they open up their heart to you before you begin to start going in and fixing things and changing things. I pray that you understand what I'm talking about. But whether you understand it or not, other people intuitively do this. And when you just go up to a person on the street and you just jump right in front of them and say, you're going to hell, repent or else, turn or burn. You know, that's the way that a lot of evangelism is done. Did you know that most people are offended by that? Because who gave you the right and the authority to come and judge this person? You don't know if they're born again or not. You don't know what their relationship with God is. You're just assuming that they don't have a relationship with God. Even though God has used some of those things because He loves people so much, and that may be the only way some people ever hear about God, and I'm sure there are some people born again that way, it is violating this authority that we have. And I think in most cases, we would be much better off to come like Jesus did in the fourth chapter of the book of John. He came to this woman at the well and he humbled himself and asked for her help. And there was such a division and such a prejudice between the Jews and the Samaritans that this woman was shocked that a Jew would ask a Samaritan woman for anything and immediately he had her attention. And she said, how is it that you being a Jew ask drink of me that is a woman of Samaria? And Jesus began to say, if you knew who I was and if you knew what I could do, you would have asked water of me and I would have given you living water. And then she says, well, what? You don't have anything to draw water with. Where do you get living water from? See, and he struck up a conversation. He showed this woman that he valued her more than the typical Jew would have done. And he, he won her to himself first. And then when her heart was opened up, she said, oh God, give, I mean, she said, oh Lord, give me ever more this living water. In other words, she says, I, I, she was making a confession that I need living water. I'm, I'm destitute. I'm not happy. I need something in my life. And she opened up and said, give me this living water. And then Jesus said, go call your husband. And she said, I don't have a husband. And then he began to prophesy and he said, you've rightly said you don't have a husband because you've had five husbands and the man you're living with now is not your husband. So you said the truth. Immediately now, he had just taken this thing to a brand new level to where she realized he was speaking under the anointing of God. He was somebody special. And see, this is how he reached people. He didn't just go and grab people off the streets, but he would go and heal their body. He would go and meet a need. He would go and 
say, I've got living water if you want any of it. And if they were receptive to it, then he would continue. You have to, in a sense, earn a right to speak into a person's life. You've got authority and power, but you can't just go out and use it as if you are the only person that's involved. See, this is one of the things. People, when they hear about healing, they just immediately want to go into a hospital and empty the hospital. They want to pray for their family members and make them get healed. And they don't understand that you can't take your authority and use it against another person's authority. They have to choose. They have to reach out and they have to believe. And because of this, people all of the time go to praying for somebody they believe 100% that it's God's will for them to be well, and so they're going to get this person well off of their faith, and they don't ever take into account the other person, what they're believing. Sometimes people are resistant and antagonistic towards the healing power of God, but sometimes they know it exists. They even desire it, but in their heart, there's still issues that they haven't dealt with that are giving Satan this inroad. You know, I started today's program talking about James 3.16, where it says, where there's envy and strife, there's confusion in every evil work. And sometimes people don't recognize that through this strife, they have given Satan so much dominion, authority in their life that I can't come in and counter it. They're going to have to cut that uh, inroad that they gave Satan. They're going to have to stop it. You know, I went to a church one time in Corpus Christi, Texas, and this church had just taken a stand that it was God's will to heal every person every time. They had prior to this believed God could heal, but you just asked and then it was a roll of the dice. You never knew what God was going to do. But they had taken a stand and there was a kid that had been in a coma for like six days and he died. And they had the funeral just a few days before I got there and the church was in turmoil because they had been praying, fasting and praying and believing for this child to be well. I went out to eat with the parents two or three days and I didn't know what to tell them except I talked along this lines that we have a part to play in this. And who knows what was going on behind the scenes. You can't just enforce God's will if something else has been done that has given Satan place. And I didn't know the situation, so I didn't know what to tell them, but I was telling them it's not God that failed. Somehow or another, we or something failed. Anyway, it's a long story, but to cut this short, I found out later that there was so much strife in that home that they had already decided to get a divorce. There was a tremendous amount of anger. This child, he was in high school and he had a fight with his mom that very day and the mom said, get out of our house. I never want to see you again. And this child went to school during lunch, broke the rules, left the school ground, went over to a friend's house. They were playing with a gun, playing Russian roulette, and he shot himself in the head. And that's the reason he was in the coma. And even though the church fasted and prayed, you know what? There was a direct inroad through all of this strife that was given to the devil, and they just couldn't overcome that with their fasting and prayer. See, there are limits to this authority. You have to recognize other people have authority. And if they willingly open themselves up to the devil, sometimes you aren't going to stop that. Your, your uh, relative may have Alzheimer's or dementia or something like that. And you think this is terrible and I've got to do something about it. But is this person consistently for 20, 30, 40, 50 years been rejecting the supernatural power of God, has been neglecting their spiritual life, has been sowing seeds for this. Maybe they've been afraid of this their entire life and they have been releasing a negative power of fear for this. And then you're going to come into their life and just instantly override 50 years worth of them believing. See, it doesn't work that way. You have to take into account that you're like a policeman, you can't just enforce your own whims. You have to follow the laws. And the laws are that even Jesus himself could not do many mighty works because of their unbelief. If Jesus was limited by the unbelief of other people and this authority issue factored into what he could do, then I can guarantee you it's also factoring in to what you can do. You have to learn these laws from God and cooperate with them. You can't ignore them.
I love the Believer's Authority. Uh, I believe the subtitle is What You Didn't Learn in Church. And you know, I learned a lot in church over the years, but it was all wrong. We have the authority on the inside of us. We have the same power that raised Christ from the dead on the inside of us. And we, the words we speak, they're, they're powerful. Everybody in the kingdom of God has that power. So I'm really thankful to, to Andrew Womack and all of his ministry, all of his staff, because I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for him. Our family is completely transformed because of his teachings. Andrew's complete teaching titled The Believer's Authority was recorded live at a Gospel Truth Seminar. It's available on either CD or DVD, or you can get the original six-part DVD series as seen on TV. Each is available for a gift of any amount.